off, Clippy. No one likes you, Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Business Plays. I, as always, am your host, Simon. Today, as always, Danny has written us an article all about the dot-com boom. We're gonna go through it. It's easy to forget just how exciting the internet was back in the 90s when it first started making sputtering noises down our telephone lines. It was. I remember one of the first things I was excited about was how easy it was to get cheat codes for those original Grand Theft Auto games. Like, before you'd have to spend like four pounds on a magazine and look in the back for cheat codes. Then you could go on to like cheat code central i think it was called and just grab as many cheats as you wanted it was awesome it's also quite a personal sobering thought that any young viewers of this video may not even have been born when the internet first started slowly chugging and churning its way into millions of homes across the world when did that start was it like i was born in 1987 was that really happening back then so definitely don't we didn't i didn't have it like when i was a young kid it's sometimes equally hard to remember what we did in those very early days this was before facebook before twitter Twitter, before Wikipedia, before YouTube, even before Simon Wiss. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. In fact, it was before nearly all the platforms that we're likely regularly using today. Yeah, there's definitely maybe like BBC News was back, it was around back when the internet started up. That's probably the only website that I use that was back around back then. If anyone has any good examples of websites that have stuck around that are still commonly used today that were around, and let's say like 1995, post them below. The internet felt more like a blank canvas that we hadn't quite figured out how to properly use yet. In the meantime, we were building our own rubbish websites and blindly stumbling around dodgy online chat rooms until somebody could tell us what we should be doing. Yeah, anyone else made a sh website with GeoCities back in the day? I bet it's not just me. The world of business was equally excited about the untapped commercial potential of the emerging internet, leading to a massive surge in share prices of internet-based startups on the Nasdaq stock exchange. This frenzied period of heavy investing now goes by different names. The dot-com boom, the dot-com bubble, the tech bubble, that time when all the share prices of internet-based companies went up really high and then went really low again. Because, of course, the bubble did eventually pop and most of those businesses went bust resulting in the loss of billions of dollars. But what exactly went wrong with the dot-com boom? From the perspective of the Nasdaq stock exchange, things were looking pretty promising during the growth bubble between 1994 and 2000. Well, of course they were looking promising. It was during the growth bubble. It's like, hey, the market's going up. Woo! It'll never go down! As the second largest stock exchange in the world after the New York Stock Exchange, the Nasdaq is primarily known as the place to trade in high-tech, high-growth, and some might say volatile stocks. It was always going to make a perfect home for a flood of new internet-based starter companies that surfaced through the 90s. And by the way, I'm betting the number of parallels we're going to see throughout this article with what's going on today in 2019 is going to be high already. Like, it was a great place for new internet, internet companies that were emerging through the 90s and today. Investors were positively itching to latch on to the next big thing and just couldn't throw enough money at shiny new internet companies. By 1999, 39% of all venture capital investments were getting dished out to internet startups. The Nasdaq rose five-fold during this period, hitting an all-time high in the year 2000. But when the bubble burst later on that year, the Nasdaq dropped dramatically, eventually losing 77% of its value since the peak. Over half the new startups went under, including some really big hitters, as many of the companies which had previously been valued at millions of dollars were now valued at absolutely nothing. And by the way, I should say just before we really get into it today that this was actually a viewer suggestion. I think I mentioned in the video about AOL that if anyone wanted to learn about the dot-com bubble, we would. So if you've got suggestions, leave them below, vote up the ones you like, and well, I'll get Danny to write something and we can learn about it together. If they're interesting, if they're boring, I just won't. Thanks for playing. The simple answer is that everyone, investors and business owners alike, completely lost the plot. Investors seemed to hit a long period of panic investing during the boom. I didn't even know panic investing was a thing. It's like, oh no, I've got so much money. What do I do with it? Internet-based companies were seen as a lucrative future. They may not have all been making piles of money at the time, but the assumption was they would be raking in billions very soon as the commercialization and monetization of the internet took shape. So investors quickly became scared of missing out on the gravy train. Ah, it's like FOMO. So you're like, ooh, all these internet companies. But if I don't invest my $10, how am I ever going to make a million? <laughs> Instead of investing in intensively researched companies, they just started wildly throwing stacks of money at any old sh 
that had .com after the name. Seriously. Yeah, I remember this happening. People just thought this was the next big thing. It was going to be, it's got a .com after it? Give them some money! While some companies were obviously more credible than others, many investors were giving millions of dollars to new startups that were little more than an idea on a beer mat. Like I said, there are definitely parallels going on today. Like, I've talked to people and I've read stories and all of this stuff where it's like someone has an idea for a business and the next thing they know they've got like half a million dollars in seed capital to just try it out. No customers, no profits, nothing. Just like, hey, I've got this idea. It's like, uh, it's Airbnb for motorhomes. Boom. Half a million. I bet there is Airbnb for both times. <laughs> Some of these companies were just a website with a name. There was no business model, no customers, no clear strategy for generating money in the future. Just a blind hope that all the investors would eventually become rich one day when the, because the company just had a dot com in the title. It seems that common sense went right out of the window. The attitude of the new company owners didn't really help matters. Many of them suddenly became millionaires overnight from heavy investments in their business ideas that weren't yet generating any money. The general concern behind the dot-com theory was that if a new internet company was to survive and grow, it first needed to focus on rapidly expanding its customer base. Oh my god, the parallels. The number of apps, the number of businesses, the number of websites that are just focused on customer acquisition at the cost of everything else. Today, not back in 1999, is just the same. This often involved spending about 90% of the capital on widespread marketing with the expectation of huge initial losses in the short term, but massive profits for all of those at the end of the cyberspace rainbow. We all know that, how that worked out. The rest of the capital often got spent on big salaries, plush new offices, and funky swivel chairs that cost about $5,000 a piece. Well, I suppose when the company goes bankrupt, at least you can sell your fancy swivel chair. <laughs> Although then the economy is bad, so no one wants to spend $5,000 on a chair. After all, these guys were dot-com millionaires now, they could afford a bit of luxury. Not for long, fellas. The result from all of this was billions of investment dollars that were getting thrown away on promoting new companies that weren't actually going anywhere and didn't look like they were going to generate money anytime soon. It took a while for the market to catch on that all of this might have been a bad idea. Following the peak, things got a little twitchy when the tech industry went through a bad news period. Later in 2000, the AOL Time Warner merger talked about that in my video about AOL. I'm going to link to that below. That was questioned by analysts while Microsoft was found guilty of monopolization of the market. Big companies such as Dell and Cisco suddenly started selling their own shares. That is never a good sign. As Wall Street Press began publishing warning stories that the dot-com bubble seemed to be all hot air with no real credibility of prospect of yielding a return. And this is like, yeah, this is all it takes. Big investors started to rethink their strategy and withdraw their investments, quickly leading to a panic sell of shares across the whole industry. Yeah, just kick something off and then everything tumbles down. In a very short space of time, many of these companies had suddenly lost all of their advertising dollars, which was the only thing meant to be pushing their company forward. In many cases, a company had started out with a value of zero, rapidly become worth hundreds of millions of dollars, blown millions of investors' dollars on advertising, and then fallen right back down to zero again. There were some big names that went under. The online pet supply store Pets.com had been pretty well known at the time thanks to the popularity of its funky sock puppet mascot, which appeared in a high-profile marketing, including a TV advert broadcast during the lucrative 2000 Super Bowl commercial break. It didn't seem to matter at the time that Pets.com was spending $11.8 million on marketing, but only generating, wait for it, $619,000 in revenue. <laughs> they were certainly pulling in plenty of new customers with bargain deals, but they were doing this by selling many of the products for a third of the price that it costs to acquire them. Yeah, no wonder. If there's a pet website, it's like, yeah, it's just way cheaper than everyone else. Of course I'm going to shop there. Especially if it's cheaper than wholesale. The business was, of course, optimistically looking to the long-term future after it had built up its customer base, but the rug was pulled and out from underneath the company's feet in late 2000 after burning through over $300 million dollars of investors' money and eventually going into liquidation. And also, they're like, yeah, it's going to be great in the future, right? Right? Well, guys, at some point, you're going to have to sell stuff to actually make a profit. So your prices are going to go up. And then I'm going to be like, no, nah, I'll, just, I'll just find somewhere cheaper or shop at my local store or any reason that's more convenient than Pets.com. Doesn't seem like a great business strategy. Customer acquisition isn't everything. It wasn't all bad news, though. Well, good. The sock puppet survived the crash. Oh, this is it. And went on to appear in commercials for an American automotive loan firm alongside the slogan, everyone deserves a second chance. Well, at least the people liquidating that company is like, well, what have we got? We've got some fancy swivel chairs. 
Uh, we've got this sock puppet. We'll sell the sock puppet. And that'll go back to the investors. Maybe that'll get them their $300 million back. Boo.com, terribly named, was another famous casualty of the dot-com boom. Styling itself as a futuristic online retailer of sports and fashion brands, website visitors were helped along by a friendly virtual shopping assistant called Miss Boo. Miss Boo sounds like Clippy. Hi, it looks like you're trying on clothes. F off, Clippy. No one likes you, I think Pip Clippy was a dude. <laughs> I'm Clippy. Now, the distinctive idea behind the website was that you could pop your chosen clothes onto virtual 3D body models to review the results and see if that tweed blazer was really going to cut the mustard in your wardrobe. This doesn't sound like a great idea, and it definitely doesn't sound like a great idea running on like 2000s technology. Even today, clothing shops will ship you out the clothes to try on and offer free returns because everyone knows that online 3D models. <laughs> It's just not the same. Also, if it's just an online 3D model, why not just show real models wearing the clothes? The technology cost $6 million to build and half a million dollars to, to maintain every single month. Fueled by keen investors, Boo.com spent a further $25 million on marketing before they even had any products to sell, and then another $135 million on marketing when the website had supposedly gone live. Supposedly. Unfortunately, due to timing issues, the website wasn't quite ready on time, and many curious visitors were just greeted with a holding page. Even when the website was up and running, it took ages to load, was plagued by technical issues, and was ultimately a clumsy and awkward experience for shopping. After squandering all those millions on advertising, the generated revenue from customers fell spectacularly short of expectations, and the liquidators were soon called in. Look, I, I know I'm kind of viewing this with a great deal of skepticism, and hindsight's 2020 and all that, but really. <laughs> of course, not every internet-based company crashed and burned. Google, eBay, Amazon, they all took a massive hit at one point. Amazon's value dropped by a staggering 90%, but they all managed to weather the storm and are still around today through shrewd accounting and stronger business strategies that were based on something a little more solid than just blind hope. You might even have heard of a few of them. But if there's one good thing to have come out of this sorry mess is that the industry has learned its lesson and this could never happen again in a million years. This is definitely going to happen again. This video is going out, I'm recording this on the 2nd of October 2019. This is going to happen again. According to analysis by the Warrington College of Business at the University of Florida, the number of unprofitable companies on the US stock exchange has now reached a record high with 81% of listed companies making a loss. There are of and it's an inc the economy is doing great. 81% are making a loss in 2019. It's October. The economy is amazing. Guys, what's going to happen when the economy is not amazing anymore? Because it's going to happen. <laughs> there are obvious parallels here to be drawn with the dot com boom. Although this time round, it would probably go down in history as the app boom. Ride hailing apps such as Uber and Lyft are just two examples of apps which are currently generating massive investments but aren't yet profitable. Could we be heading for another crash? Well, we're always heading for another crash because the business cycle goes up and down it doesn't just go whoosh. doesn't always just go always up it's always going to come down we're always headed towards a crash and then after that we're always heading towards a boom so yes when is the big question this has been business plays i do hope you enjoyed this episode thank you for whoever suggests or i think i suggested this and everyone said it was a good idea so we made this the video i'd recommend checking out now if you enjoyed this one and haven't seen it yet is the aol video which i will link to below thank you everyone oh, smash that like button subscribe hit the bell all of that good stuff and i'll see you next time